Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit in this 39th lecture. We finally move on to Revealed Religion, the last phase of religion and the last section of any kind before we reach Absolute Knowing, which will, of course, be the 40th lecture released in just a few days at the latest. And although we do technically have to go back to that introductory material at the very beginning of the book, since um, it was skipped when we started the group reading about a year and a half ago when we just got right into sense certainty um even though it's still technically more to be done with it next week a little bit anyway um it's still a moment for celebration right now i think to consider that we're reaching the end of this text in the literal sense of the last phase of the book okay um the last two phases of the book are what we're doing in this lecture and the, and the next one and that is something which we should stop for a moment and consider as perhaps an accomplishment which Many have set out to do, um, in the sense that many people have started Phenomenology of Spirit, but I don't know the percentage who have actually reached the very end of a, a an enormously difficult book, um, one which has been called legendarily difficult um, by uh, the professors who basically use that as an excuse not to teach it. They're basically saying, well, we can't teach you a course on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit because it's too difficult. And there is some truth to that, since... Um, in my own experience of being in academia, even the people I, I met who were the most serious about philosophy would typically spend an entire year reading the phenomenology of spirit, um, whereas we as a school have basically gone through the whole book within a few months. And this was something which was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done in my life, intellectually speaking. Uh, pretty much every ounce of my energy over the past two months, uh, two and a half months, has, has gone into this reading. But it's also been one of the most productive and fulfilling and enlightening and fun um, things I've ever really done, you know, with my mind, is, is this group reading uh, with you guys over, over Hegel. So I, I, I um, appreciate everybody who's been a part of it. And um, I remind you that you can become a full member of the School of Forbidden Text for just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So as we finally enter the last section before absolute knowing, we quick, quick, uh, quickly realize excuse me, that it is one of the most difficult um, sections of the entire book and also one of the longest. Unlike the earlier phases of, say, natural religion or um, religion in the form of art, uh, both of which explicitly divided themselves up into so many subsections with distinct titles to make the movement through the triad easier to follow because, of course, that is a really big deal in religion, maybe a bigger deal than the others. That's why we do... Um, the, we did those as a, a single video for all three phases rather than uh, give a, a an individual video to each one as had been the case earlier. Well, the interesting thing about this final phase on revealed religion is that it has no such formal divisions despite having a structure which must be grasped in order to follow what's really going on in each paragraph. And you find instead of these, uh, you know, little a, little b, little c subdivisions, um, just some 40 paragraphs of very obscure and dense uh, material over really strange topics, admittedly. And it's pretty much up to you to take these 40 paragraphs and um, restore that structure. I am, that is exactly what we're going to do in this video. So above all, I think I want to emphasize that this section on revealed religion will deal with, of course, Christianity. That's the kind of manifest religion which Hegel is interested in, and particularly the Christianity of modern Europe. That is to say, the Christianity of Martin Luther in Germany, rather than the kinds of Christianity which sort of appeared earlier within the text, but perhaps by Hegel's standard are not really Christianity. For example, you had uh, medieval asceticism with the unhappy consciousness in um, lecture six, but we found that that's not really religion in the sense of it's not giving you a reconciliation between the finitude of, of uh, nature and the infinity of self-consciousness. In fact, it's just trying to escape from not only this world of nature, but even from one's own self. And that lack of reconciliation is why um, it did not occur within the uh, section on religion, despite seeming to be just that. You also had the kind of Christianity of Pascal, who um, accepts his own inability to understand the unsolvable paradoxes of religion, but accepts this as the necessary epistemological correlate of a kind of thing which he is positing, which cannot be found in this um, realm of being at all, but can only be um, projected as a beyond, which he believes someday he'll reach, but he cannot actually access it in any way 
in this life. And that um, is also a failure to have a reconciliation between the finitude of nature and the infinity of self-consciousness. That's why Pascal also um, did not occur within the phase on religion. So by the time you get um, basically Lutheranism, you have something rather different. But of course, this section of the text will also deal with things um, from, a, let's just say, a long time before um, pr the Protestant Reformation. You also deal in this um, section of the text with uh, things like um, the fall of Adam and Eve, you know, um, and also the fall of Lucifer himself, events from, you know, a really, really long time ago, and, of course, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But Hegel revisits these uh, biblical and semi-biblical topics um, in a way that differs so much from the traditional view of Christianity as to be perhaps heretical by some standards. In his unconventional readings of these events, Hegel demonstrates that although revealed religion is the last phase before absolute knowing, it is not in itself the same thing as absolute knowing. For religion, even at its highest phase, still tries to think the absolute through picture thoughts like that of Adam and Eve, that of, um, you know, the incarnation of Jesus in the traditional sense of that term, like the fall of Lucifer. So it's trying to think the absolute, but through these sort of picture thoughts, which as you as they might be, still must be transcended, Hegel says, by notional thinking in order to reach that final phase. At any rate, if we now begin at paragraph 748, we find that the previous Greek phase of religion as art had advanced beyond the um, Egyptian phase of, I guess, religion as craft by capturing much more explicitly the subjective act in the objective form of an externalized gestalt, as I mentioned in great detail in the last video. By the final phase of comedy, however, this logic was pushed to the point of absurdity in the perverse revelation that the mysterious void of fate into which even the Greek gods themselves had vanished and returned by the end of the Orestia was actually just the negativity of my own self-consciousness. In a very strange return of the riddle of the Sphinx, comedy reveals that the answer is once again just me. In comedy, former hierarchical distinctions um, also collapse and reveal the self to be the absolute being and man to be the only measure of truth for there is no longer any projection of these absolute or eternal values beyond me which I can only access you know, from one remove away. No, actually, insofar as there are values, they were just made up by me or someone, some other guy like me. Paragraph 749 notes, however, the grand irony that this final conclusion of the phase of religion as Greek art is actually the exact opposite of what one might call religion. For this sort of humanism is actually just the secularism which moves beyond religion in just the same way that any absolutization of the self would have to. When Hegel says, we have to remember what shape of that spirit it is which expresses it, as I quote him himself, he reminds us basically that the secularized political order which follows after the decline of Greece is none other than the Roman Empire, which we already met before in that lengthy chapter on spirit. Paragraph 750 notes that whereas the religion of art had the content of the Greek ethicality because it belonged to the substance of the Greek polis, comedy paves the way for Rome to absolutize the self as the abstract subject who has legal rights in a way that must be understood in this context as the merely negative loss of all of that ethical content which you had within the polis. Paragraph 751 notes that the Roman Stoic reacts to this disappearance of content by withdrawing into his own thinking, which becomes a pseudo-notional thinking about thought itself, while the skeptic follows after him by turning such negativity into a philosophy that merely says no to everyone else's ideas without having any of one's own. The unhappy consciousness is now better understood as the explicit consciousness of this complete loss of content, which the abstract self of Roman legal rights really is. 
We now realize that this unhappy consciousness is the ironic return of the same tragic fate, but now to, uh, returning to the absolutized self of comedy, who was, of course, supposed to be the exact opposite of unhappy. That was the laughing consciousness, which was able to, I guess, be happy with the um, state of the world that uh, the conclusion of uh, the Greek phase of art had left it with. Well, it's no longer happy by the time you reach this phase, for the unhappy happy consciousness is just the knowledge of this loss as such. Paragraph 753 notes that this secularization of the Roman political order is not a positive liberation as we moderns might assume, because insofar as the world is disenchanted, it only drives it into a state of mourning that anticipates the return of religion at some point in the future. Hegel provides a long list of formerly sacred things that had now lost all of their former character as religious to become instead so much stuff. As the oracles are now silent, the statues in the temple are reduced to so much stone, hymns no longer express belief but are just words to be studied for historical value, the athletic festivals maybe still happen but they lack any connection to the divine, they're just entertainment like a modern um, American football game, and the tables of the gods provide no spiritual food or drink, as I quote Hegel himself. This last reference stands out in particular, though, as a mysterious maiden offers us this fruit once again, as a strange erinnering or inwardizing of the old gifts, which were, of course, gifts of nature, but can no longer be seen as the gifts of the gods which they were when, say, the cult members literally consumed the living Ceres and Bacchus in rich, uh, the religious ritual. But at the same time, when this maiden offers us this fruit, it's not simply a regression back to the status of so much merely natural material. Hegel admits that there is enjoyment that is no longer worship, but enjoyment nonetheless, because the girl's status as more than nature still gestures forward to a certain return of spirit, which all of creation at this point desperately longs for. All of creation longs to escape Rome's secularization, not because it is the barbarism of pre-Christian paganism, as we moderns might expect, but actually just because this demystification is so freaking dull. Hegel called the Pax Romana the quote-unquote boredom of the world, for much the same reason that Pax Americana was even more dull than that. This demystification reaches its most boring and also most absurd form in the perverse fact that the empire is not technically without any official religion, for it still mandates that one worship the emperor, but the emperor is just one mortal man who is treated as a god on earth despite lacking any justification for such a title. Rather than give us the real incarnation of Jesus Christ as God through the form of a man, the emperor is something of a mockery of this, which simply translates comedy's absolutization of the self into a literal political arrangement. The true coincidence of man and God on the earth within history will, of course, arrive, but only at the right time. And paragraph 754 notes that the conditions for that mysterious birth to take place at Bethlehem can only be found through the grief of the unhappy consciousness itself. For we now understand the birth at Bethlehem to simply be the determinate negation thereof. Paragraph 755, we learn that because spirit has two sides, that is, of course, both substance and self-consciousness, paragraph 756 warns us that the true birth at Bethlehem must not be confused with the false view of Jesus in, say, the pseudo-religion of Gnosticism, which was pretty popular at about the same time in history. Gnosticism, Hegel warns us, merely imagines spirit into a fictitious and purely intellectual existence, largely through recycling older ideas from former religions, but playing these strange linguistic games with uh, reading hidden meanings below the surface in a doubling of the text which only those initiated into the cult will have access to at this uh, deeper level. 
In a strange metaphor, Hegel warns that this borrowed garment is not religion at all, but only the dark night which had preceded any externalization of spirit into a concrete historical gestalt, as you remember at the very beginning of this phase on religion. It is because Gnosticism is far too subjective that it lacks any true embodiment within the actuality of history. And for this reason, paragraph 757 notes in contrast that the true incarnation of Christ is not the result of any one person's creative imagination, but is instead based in strict necessity. The incarnation only arrives at the particular moment in history when such necessity is objectively reflected in the external things of the world rather than be limited to, say, the idealistic um, state of one's own mental faculties, etc. Paragraph 758 notes that the incarnation differs from the earlier phases of Greek art which use the external medium of nature to try to imperfectly express the divine, for in the incarnation this gap between the two is actually closed by having a man who does not symbolize God but directly is God. When Jesus is incarnated on earth as a living person, he is immediately sensed by those near him rather than imagined as in Gnosticism or produced through labor as would be the case in Greek art. Above all, the crucial difference is that now God himself is also self-conscious and embodied within historical actuality. Paragraph 759, we now realize that this incarnation of divine being is the simple content of absolute religion itself, because this incarnation is the hermeneutical revelation of divine being, which directly discloses it, rather than remain stuck at the abstract level of merely describing some higher order predicates, such as um, finding it good enough to merely talk about the, the righteous, or the creator, or the good, as you might find in this perverse sort of um, rationalism um, or deism of the 18th century. What is beheld in this disclosure is just the true unity of human and divine nature. As Jesus' mysterious pronouncement that the lowest shall be the highest and the highest shall be the lowest now makes proper sense as the description of this strange gestalt of God as man who Jesus Christ himself actually was. Paragraph 760 emphasizes that God does not, however, come down to our level to meet us where we're at because we can't rise any higher. This idea misses the point that God himself can only attain his own highest essence if he does so in man himself. Only now is consciousness of the finite and self-consciousness of the infinite really identical with one another rather than um, uh, only seeming to be so as would be the case in art. Paragraph six, uh, 761 emphasizes that revealed religion is speculative knowledge for both concern the knowledge of the universal in the, in the individual. Paragraph 762 notes that because this manifest religion appears within history, it must be developed in three stages of revelation, which in turn correspond to the three stages of the development of the religious community or the church itself. These three stages are the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but as could be expected, the first phase is that of sense certainty, as the life of Jesus satisfies the ideal of an immediacy, which is later sublated in the second phase of Jesus' death, which instead presents him through the perception of a universal thing with so many properties. In the third phase, Jesus' ascent up into heaven presents him as the purely intelligible essence or the object of the understanding. By this phase, we realize the strange irony that God's incarnation in man is most complete when the spirit is actually incarnate in all of us as a community of believers. Paragraph 764 to 5, however, warn that this biblical account of life, death, and resurrection of a particular guy 
are certainly useful insofar as this picture thinking of the absolute content allows us to begin to understand things we could never even begin to, I guess, imagine understanding otherwise, um, but they must still be recognized as just that, a sort of picture thinking which must be transcended in order to grasp the full truth notionally. The biggest problem with such picture thinking is its tendency to split up the here and now with some beyond which lies beyond it. Uh, pun intended, the believer, of course, projects this beyond as the true fulfillment of this truth, which can only be disclosed out there in heaven rather than here. Rather than defer to an infinitely distant beyond, however, Hegel suggests in paragraph 766 that one must examine the evolution of consciousness within the believing community in history, for we find in paragraph 767 that the first moment of this conceptual content is actually best represented through the picture thinking of God as pure substance, which is, of course, God the Father as he existed before the creation. But this is also God in his movement into a descent to a singular existence, which is picture thought as God begetting the Son, who is, in fact, he himself. The main thing to notice here is that whereas the physical force of electricity we saw in Lecture 3 on the understanding had to be moved into this motion by its opposite force, spirit doesn't have such a requirement, for spirit is both spontaneous and self-mediating, and can therefore externalize itself into otherness without any need for some external stimulus which would be fully independent of something which is of course supposed to be absolute. Already at this very early phase then, God is the pure substance, but also the being of self, through the Father and the Son respectively. But now that we're on the subject of the beginning, can you please remind me what was there in the beginning? Oh yeah, that's right, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At this extremely late phase of the book, then, we now revise our older stance towards language once again, realizing now that according to the Bible itself, that which Jesus incarnates in the flesh is just the Word. So language is now understood to be Spirit's Dasein. But now that we are talking about divine speech rather than just the human speech which we have otherwise uh, limited ourselves to thus far within the text, we now realize that the difference between the two is that whereas human speech communicates a meaning, divine speech creates meaning. But this is just another way of saying that God creates himself, and this self-creation is the properly understood dialectical form of language too. We now see in paragraph 770 that God is the circular movement resolving substance and subject and vice versa. This in turn leads us to realize in paragraph 772 that Father, Son, etc. are picture thoughts which risk obscuring the fluidity of Logos in favor of distinct, substantial, and changeless identities understood naively as so many different persons. In paragraph 773, we then transition to the second moment by considering the creation of the world. While this creation really is God's self-othering into substantial and existing otherness, the picture thought of God's creation of the world risks obscuring its true character as absolute movement. We now see that this world also contains a new self-consciousness manifest in the story as Adam and Eve, who are indeed in a state of innocence, but not yet capable of actually being good. Interestingly, Hegel argues that this is precisely because they are merely natural beings at this phase, and therefore not capable of something like anxiety. In proto-existentialist terms, Hegel notes that because a natural being already is what it is supposed to be, for example, a tree already is fully a tree, doesn't have to work on being or becoming a tree, already is that, he basically argues that um, the inner tension of having to exist without yet achieving the essence one is supposed to have, which is of course the state of anxiety, has not yet been possible for Adam and Eve, and that is because they have not yet become capable of something like knowledge. 
Because this transition into knowledge is necessary, Hegel warns that it is useless to try to play um, time travel fantasy games which ask, what if Adam and Eve had just never eaten that damn apple? For this sort of picture thinking obscures the deeper truth that men must fall to become fully self-conscious. This is not a matter of free will then, but instead of strict logical necessity. In paragraph 775, Adam and Eve find, after eating the fruit, that their merely sensuous consciousness, similar to that of animals, suddenly transforms into thought, and more specifically into the thought of good and evil. The greatest challenge of the entire section will prove to be accounting for both of these things, as even, say, Bart Ehrman has noted that um, it was not all of the historical, quote-unquote, problems of Christianity he learned as a New Testament scholar which um, caused him to call his own faith into question. It was something much simpler than that. It was just the inability, he claims, of any religion to solve the mystery of why evil exists if God is all good. Well, similarly, uh, explaining why evil exists if God is good will prove to be the most difficult part of one of the most difficult sections of this book as well. Hegel reminds us, though, that it is only picture thinking which would misrecognize good and evil as two independent and mutually opposed things in the first place. Notional thinking, of course, will later on see that the truth is a good deal more complicated, but in a certain sense also simpler than that. At any rate, eating the fruit leads Adam and Eve into a new unhappy consciousness as their new ability for thought leads them to turn inwards, revealing a new conflict between the essential and the non-essential self, similar to that experienced by the medieval ascetic. We find in paragraph 776 that picture thought attempts to explain the origin of the thoughts of both good and evil by correlating each of these with a different set of angels. We now find that before the creation of the world itself had even occurred, God had already created so many angels who were originally all good, but were themselves tempted to commit the first real sin of pride. Lucifer gave into this temptation and led many other angels to fall with him into the state of being so many evil demons, the major war in heaven following shortly afterwards. Jesus himself, we now find, was only created after Lucifer fell. Hegel warns, however, that this attempt to explain away the origin of evil by descending even deeper into the past will only lead one even further into a, a, an infinite regression which will never actually reach a satisfactory conclusion. Notice, for example, that we had to talk about what happened before the creation of the world to do this, and even to a time before the creation of Jesus himself. Well, this will only lead further and further away from actually solving the problem of understanding the relation between good and evil, because God himself, Hegel reminds us, had to come down from heaven in order to make the good itself into an actual self-consciousness within history, rather than leave it at the level of an abstract idea which the newly thinking Adam and Eve try and fail to solve on purely rational grounds. Ironically, Hegel argues that the true incarnation is not what happened at Bethlehem with the birth, it was rather what happened at Golgotha on the cross, for only in this passage through death could God himself be fully re reconciled with man, if only because being fully human means that one cannot escape death no matter what one does. So now that we remember all of those references to a passage through death earlier within uh, the uh, chapter on spirit, it seems that now we know what they were really gesturing forward towards. We find, though, that the middle term um, uniting these extremes must be the abiding Dasein of the community, which lives on even as its own members die and come to be replaced by others over the centuries, and certainly lives on long after the uh, physical Jesus Christ himself had lived, uh, died, and had been resurrected up into heaven. This death of God, then, which we thought was the thing we were dealing with, is therefore really just the resurrection of spirit into nature, 
through the living community into which that spirit had been poured forth. We now finally transition to the third moment of this community itself. A saying in paragraph 780 that it is not only Jesus who must pass through death to be resurrected, but the believers too who through Jesus' death died to their former selves in order to be resurrected into a new nature which actually is reconciled with the spirit. This religious community finally satisfies that long-awaited ideal of a universal selfhood because God is present within the community despite having left the earth, nominally speaking, millennia ago. The solution to the origin of evil, then, finally arrives as we see that because what is external to God actually is internal to God because he's absolute, this must extend even to evil itself. Paragraph 780 notes that any attempt to picture think the origin of evil is lying in some corrupted being who is not God, for example, um, Lucifer or Adam, who were able to uh, absorb the full blame for bringing evil into existence through the, um, uh, the contingency of an event which just as easily could not have happened. This misses the point that Anything which really is absolute cannot have anything lie outside of it, be that Adam, Lucifer, or evil itself. We find in paragraph 782 that evil properly understood is not the state, ex of, um, the, the state which external nature falls into after the first sin is committed and ruins it, for this idea of nature as external to or a separate from spirit is itself already evil. Yet the situation is even more complicated than this realization, for paragraph 783 notes that this same evil moment outside of the immediacy of nature is simultaneously a necessary first step towards becoming good, since after all, goodness is a certain reconciliation which you cannot have if you remain in that naive and immediate state. Paragraph 784 notes that this, necess this uh, necessary link between evil and good is of course missed by the picture thinking of the devout believer who sees such good and evil as contingent events of history, which had to be willed into existence by fallible beings who could have just as easily decided not to do good or not to do evil. The fact that it misses this irony is itself ironic, for the believing community is sufficiently spiritually advanced to understand the paradox that Jesus' death on the cross was itself necessary not only for his own resurrection, but for those of the believers too, who are of course reborn to eternal life through his death. This revelation that the true resurrection and incarnation lie in the community also reveals that the true reconciliation of spirit and nature lies within the community in the form of the mutual forgiveness by which so many mortal sinners are forgiven by one another despite maintaining their nature as sinful humans rather than simply defer that forgiveness or redemption into some mysterious beyond which, say, the unhappy consciousness cont uh, contents itself with imagining it will reach someday, um, just not right now. Well, the difference with, say, Lutheran Christianity is that the reconciliation happens here, and it really happens with all of us. Paragraph 785 notes that God's presence in the community's self-consciousness leads us to see in paragraph 786 that Hegel's God is actually not so different from Aristotle's, for he similarly defines it as mover, moved, and motion, rather than the picture thought of, say, three distinct persons in the traditional sense. Paragraph 787 notes, however, that... A different picture thought unfortunately remains even as the final paragraph of the, uh, the book before Absolute Knowing has been reached. The last roadblock standing at the threshold of Absolute Knowing lies in the religious community's failure to identify itself with this God. For um, it cannot bring itself to see itself as the absolute. 
if it fails to reconcile itself with this god, it will remain stuck at the level of mere religion, in which case union will always be deferred further and further to some inaccessible beyond, no different from that of the unhappy consciousness or Pascal. However, if it does bring itself to reconcile itself with this absolute, it will transition to absolute knowing. 